Welcome back to The Road Chose Me. On this episode, everything you ever wanted to know about dual batteries for your overland vehicle. So I'll go over what are dual batteries, what is the setup that I have in my Jeep that I drove all the way around Africa, what I would do differently next time, and how you can design and build your own system to meet your needs in your vehicle. So if you've ever wondered about dual batteries, stick around, there's a lot of details coming up right now. So first of all, what do we actually mean when we say dual isolated batteries? Well, just as it sounds, what it means is the vehicle actually has two batteries and they are isolated from each other. So what that means is if one drains flat, the other one is still full and you'll be able to start the vehicle. So typically this means one of the batteries is wired up just as the original battery in the vehicle. So it starts the engine, it runs the stereo, it does all those basic things. And then we add a second battery, usually we call that a house battery, and it runs things like our fridge, our lighting, it runs my water pump, I charge my laptop and my cameras from it. And so it basically is just a secondary battery so that we have more power for all of the stuff that we like to add to our vehicles. And by isolating them, it means if that house battery goes all the way down to nothing, the original starter battery is still there, still fully charged and ready to start the engine when I need to. So I won't be stranded if I accidentally run the house battery down. It really is as simple as that, but you can see already how useful that is to have in our overland vehicles. And I ran through my solar setup a couple of videos ago. My solar is directly connected to my house battery. So it's continually recharging that battery. As well as that, I have a system so that when the engine is running, the two batteries become joined together and now the alternator on the engine actually charges both batteries. So it gets recharged whenever the engine's running. When I turn the engine off, the batteries are separated, they're isolated from each other again, and then that way the starter is protected from running flat. So I'll show you right now what my setup looks like. And when it comes to who actually needs dual batteries, I would say it's a bit like solar and it depends on your personal usage. Once you have a fridge, it's something you really might want to consider because with a fridge, you run the risk of draining your starter battery to nothing and then you won't be able to start your engine. Certainly, if you're charging laptops and tablets, if you're running lots of lighting, lots of things like that, they're drawing a lot of power out of your starter battery. And even if you don't draw it all the way down, you are going to shorten its life, especially if it's not a deep cycle battery. So dual batteries starts to be something you want to think about once you have a lot of extra electronics that are going to be drawing power when your engine is turned off. So this is my setup here under the hood of the Jeep. And believe it or not, there are actually two batteries right here in the stock location. So they do just fit, but I really like this option because it means that everything is contained here under the hood and I'm not taking up precious space back in my cargo area that I'd rather have things like food or clothes taking up. It also means I don't have to run heavy cables all the way to the back of the vehicle and forward again. So it's really nice. If you can keep it contained under the hood, I recommend that. What I'm running here for batteries is these are Optima D34 yellow tops. And these are deep cycle gel batteries which means they can be mounted on their side like this. It makes no difference to the battery because they have no liquid in them. So these batteries are rated at 55 amp hours. That's how batteries are typically rated. And it's a measurement of how much capacity the battery can hold. And what it means is you can put a load on this battery of 55 amps and that'll last for one hour before the battery goes dead. 55 amps is an enormous amount. You would never put that much load on it. So it just works that you could halve that load and then you would get two hours, or you could do a quarter of that load and you'll get four hours, so on and so forth. So at 5.5 amps of current draw, which is still probably more even than my fridge uses, then you would get 10 hours before just one of these batteries is dead. So the way I've got it set up right now, the battery on top, this is the stock starter battery for the Jeep. So it's just wired to the Jeep as normal and when the engine is off, it's sitting here doing nothing at all. It's just waiting for me to turn the key. Underneath this battery is the house battery. And that one right now is being charged off the solar panels. 
and it's running all of the accessories inside the Jeep. So the fridge right now is on, all my lighting, my laptop charging, that's all wired off the bottom battery. And right now, these two batteries are isolated from each other, so they are not connected together at all. When I turn the engine on, I've got here a big solenoid, and this is just like a big switch, you can think of it. And when the engine starts up, this big switch clunks together and it joins the positive of both of these batteries together. So now they're like one huge, big 110 amp hour battery. And then they're connected to the alternator. So the alternator that's spinning with the engine, it now charges both of them as one huge, big unit. So in that way, the house battery gets charged when the engine is running, but when the engine is off, they become separate from each other and the starter battery is safe, it can't run flat, and the house battery is running all my accessories, but also still getting charged from the solar. So I designed and built this system specifically to go to Africa. So one of my key criteria was that it's just simple. There's nothing complicated here, there's no electronics, there's no digital readout, there's no smart bridging of the batteries. It's just one huge big solenoid that goes clunk to bridge them together, and then it goes clunk to separate them again. It's as simple as that, and that basically means this system can't fail, and it never has failed in the four years and horrendous conditions that it's been through. So that was primary to my design goals, and that's why I did it this way. On the market now, there's a lot of different options, and I'll go over some of those a bit later, but those are the reasons that I did what I did in my system. A couple of things that I would do differently. First of all, the housing for the dual batteries, it was specifically designed to fit these Optima yellow tops, and they do fit extraordinarily well, and it does a really good job of tucking them in there. But a downside to that is that it will only fit these Optima yellow tops. Not a big deal if you're in North America, you can always get these Optimas. But when I got into Africa, after a couple of years on the road, one of these batteries was used up. I basically had just used all of its cycles because it was so hot, my fridge was running so much, my laptop charging was drawing a lot of current as well. So I needed to replace a battery and it turned out it was difficult to locate one of these Optimas. And because of the shape and the size, other generic batteries from Africa, they just wouldn't fit in this spot in this dual battery tray. So I did manage to track down an Optima and I got it to work and it's been great ever since. But what I learned for next time, I wouldn't use a dual battery mounting system that locks me into a specific type and brand of battery. I would much rather have a tray that's bigger than necessary. And then whatever battery I put in there, I would strap down and maybe chock it with a few little pieces of wood or something so it can't move around but that gives me options down the road. If I'm in Mongolia and I need to change a battery, I'll be able to buy whatever locals are using and it will fit in my mounting system. So that's something that I would change for next time. Shut up, squirrel. The big solenoid that I have here, this is a kit from Painless Performance who do all kinds of wiring for automotive applications. And so this solenoid and all the wiring that you need to make it work, it was about $150. I'll throw a link down the bottom to Amazon and it's worked really well for me. This thing has been in service for all of Africa and a year and a half since, and it's been absolutely flawless. And that kit does come with wiring setup so that you can manually bridge the batteries if you want with a switch on your dash. And when I thought about it, I realized the biggest way that this system could fail is that if I accidentally leave the switch in the wrong position, so I just completely left that out. I have no way to manually bridge these together. It just comes on when the engine's on and it comes off when the engine's off. And I prefer it that way because then I can't make a mistake and I can't accidentally leave them bridged together when I don't want them to be. If I do want to jump start, if the starter is dead somehow, but the house battery still has charge, I can just use my jumper leads and jump the two batteries together and then start the engine. It's not complicated at all to wire this up yourself. It's really something you can tackle. And it's difficult to see here in my setup, so I'll show you a little wiring diagram. Essentially, you just connect the negatives together directly. They are always together, and that's fine. And then the two positives from both batteries, they go to each terminal of the solenoid. 
and that's essentially all there is to it. You put an earth on the solenoid and you put a little trigger wire on the solenoid that comes from somewhere that gets 12 volts when your engine is running, but then doesn't have 12 volts when the engine is off. And that's all there is to it. When the engine runs, the solenoid will clunk in, the two positives are now directly connected and you've got a big bridged battery. But when you turn your engine off, they're separated and things that you have wired to the house battery will only draw current from the house battery and the starter battery will stay isolated and it won't lose any power. So that's how simple my system is and it works really well, but things have come a long way since I designed this and there are a ton of options on the market now. Certainly one of the big developments is that lots of people are going to lithium ion batteries. So I've been reading lately, lots of people have 100 amp hour batteries. So that would be twice the capacity that I have. And usually they're much smaller and lighter than the battery I have. So that's something I'd look at next time. The other thing that I would think of improving is how my house battery is charging off the alternator. So directly connecting a battery to the alternator like this it isn't the most efficient way to charge a battery, especially if it's gotten drawn down a lot and is quite low in charge. It can take many, many hours of driving at highway speed to bring that battery back up to a full charge, which isn't always ideal. The better way to do it is to use what's called a DC to DC smart charger. So basically you take the power from the alternator and you put it into this electronic box and it uses some smarts to then up the voltage and up the amperage to then really charge the battery to maximum in a short amount of time. And there's a ton of companies now who offer these DC-DC smart chargers. And in fact, Renergy Solar even have one that's built into their charge controller. So you wire in the solar panels, you wire in a feed from the alternator, and then you wire it to your house battery. And this one unit will figure out whether it should be charging off the solar, charging off the alternator, or if the battery doesn't need charging at all. And so again, I'll stick a link down in the bottom to the Renergy store. And if you use the discount code TRCM, you get a 10% discount on basically everything in the store. So no doubt about it, that's a better way to charge your house battery is to use a DC to DC charger. And it's probably something that I'll look at next time. Charging the battery with maximum efficiency, I think is something that I'd really like to have. So there you have it. Once again, I know that's a ton of information to take in. So let me know if you've got any questions, leave a comment down below. And I'd love to hear too, what do you have for a setup? Obviously mine isn't the cutting edge and I'd really like to see and know about what people are using today. And I'll start to use that in my future vehicle build. So as always, if this has been helpful, hit the thumbs up button, please do subscribe to the channel. And there are always plenty more videos coming to teach you how to get out on the road and have your own overland adventures. Speaking of which, I'm about to set off on another one as well. But until then, maybe I'll see you on the road. Have fun out there.